Good morning. Uh, thanks for being here. I, I'm starting to see good things come together as a result of both the tornado and the coronavirus. That would not have happened if those things hadn't happened. They couldn't have happened because they were too big and too glorious, too costly and too, over, too monumental to overcome. You know, I, I'm not one that likes to speak up and put forth new ways of doing things, but this week God forced me into a corner. And I couldn't tell you why, but I was in a really foul mood on Monday, dissatisfied, so dissatisfied, I just started tossing stuff, you know, in the house. Not in, I mean, like tossing it in the trash, you know, just going through and going, don't need this, you know. Uh, I don't rare, I rarely do that. Uh, I was just pitching stuff, and thankfully I was by myself, so I just let it all out. I was so angry, but I couldn't tell you why I was angry. It was like a spirit of anger had come over me. It was the same on Tuesday. It turned into a, you know, a spirit of grumpiness by then, I guess. But uh, you know, Wednesday I had a couple of meetings, and things were still stirring in me, but they began to start to make shape, take some shape in my head. And the last meeting finally came around, and my boss talked for a while about transitions of the daycare that got destroyed in the tornado, uh, and we're going to move to another church, uh, a, a third church. Um, and, and he talked for a while about that, and then he asked if anybody had any thoughts about the move. And I just started talking about how I thought it was a really bad idea. There were too many problems to overcome and on and on and on. And the, the words just kept coming out. And then I said, well, why don't we move them to our other property? Uh, we have enough rooms there that aren't being used. And I just kept talking and and talking, but as I did so, I began to notice that the atmosphere in the room began to change. Uh, the angst that has been weighing so heavily on these daycare ladies, their, their place of employment was totally destroyed by the tornado. It is a pile of rubble. Um, and they haven't been paid in three months, you know? They, collecting unemployment, but they still come in to do stuff and to plan. And when I said what I said, that angst that had been weighing them down just lifted off their shoulders. My boss was totally receptive to the idea. The next thing I know, he's saying, let's go over to the other building and let you ladies look at it, see if it'll work. By the time we got done, there were tears of joy coming down those ladies' faces. They were ecstatic about the possibilities. They hugged me. They thanked me. My boss was smiling. Now, that doesn't mean any of this is a done deal. It's a long way to go before it happens. Uh, there's plenty of hurdles to get over. But what I'm learning out of this is that I have to learn to realize when the stuff inside is mine, and when it's not mine. Does that make sense? I was angry, but there was nothing that I was angry about. It was the Spirit of God showing me, no, this is not the right thing to do. This, we're going in the wrong direction. You need to, you need to say something. Uh, God was stirring my emotions so that I could feel the dread that the daycare people were feeling about the transition to the proposed uh, relocation. I felt it as anger fueled by frustration. They were scared and frustrated. But see, that's what happens when I get scared. I get angry. That way I don't have to be scared. Uh, there's a bit of frustration in me still, but for different reasons. My frustration is simply why there's been no one to teach me how that God speaks to people in space and time. Why have there been so few voices that say God cares about 
everything that's going on in this world. He loves his creation so much. And if you have ears to hear, he will speak to you. Why does it still take me a week to figure out what I thought was anger and frustration about my own life was really God telling me that other people were frustrated and afraid? I have no answers to that. But I'm grateful that God is speaking to me and through me and ministering to others in the process, even if I didn't know it was God at the beginning. I pray that it will get easier to hear and obey his voice in the time that I have left on the planet. So anyway, we'll continue on now with Ephesians. Uh, I'll pick up in verse uh, 29 of chapter 4 and we'll go from there. Paul writes, uh, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. I, I wonder how much the church is grieving the Holy Spirit these days. I'm pretty sure it's a whole bunch. Mostly because just like me this week, we don't have a clue what God really wants to do in time and space here and now. I do know that whatever he's going to do is beyond reason. And in fact, it is probably not reasonable at all because God pouring out his grace upon people who have rebelled against him is the most unreasonable thing in the world. If he was going to be reasonable, none of us would be breathing right now. He'd have just wiped us out and started over. Or, yeah, yeah. Um, you see, last week I experienced corrupting words coming out of my mouth. And they were all focused on me. I am my biggest enemy. I know how to cut myself to shreds in the blink of an eye. I can easily hate everything that I do. On my worst days, I can take all of that, twist it, and turn it, and pour it out on other people. Maybe not out in the open, but I can certainly do it in my head. How long until the good news penetrates my heart? How long until I no longer grieve the Holy Spirit who abides inside me? I don't know. It's taken me nearly 60 years to figure out just how much I grieve him over and over and over again. And just as long for me to want to turn away from my own will towards his will. I spent most of my life filling my head with ideas about God while never once thinking that all he wanted was to change my heart to be like his. I wanted to serve a God made in my image, and he has always wanted to transform me into his image. He wants the same for you. My heart has been so hard that it could only be humbled at this stage of my life. Um, the result of that hard heart has been that my heart has been filled with bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, the very things that Paul is talking about there in the chapter, the very things that we're told to put away. So let that sink in for, you, for a minute. My seeking after God produced in me the things that God told me to put away. I'm reminded of what Jesus' brother James said. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. I see that in our nation, this week especially, the last couple of weeks. Both sides are angry, but anger does not produce righteousness. I don't care which side you're on. I don't care who you're angry at. It does not produce righteousness. There's only one thing that produces righteousness. And that's the grace of God. Being good in God's eyes is not something that we can do on our own. We have to receive it as a gift. There is none good, no, not one. And all the so-called good things that you and I do are nothing more than filthy rags. You see, we're called to put away our will by the grace of God. 
including malice. Uh, so that we can, by the grace of God, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. See, God doesn't come to you and say, I'm going to give you grace if. If you just shape up, I'm going to give you grace. No, he doesn't say that at all. He says, I'm going to give you grace. And then he lets you waste that grace for 20 or 30 years or 40 years. And he says, it's still there. Do you want it? I've been trying to give it to you all this time. And you keep think, faking like you're taking it. And then you go off and do your own thing. When are you going to let me give you grace? When are you going to let me be Lord of your life? When are you going to let me kill you so you can live? See, when he says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you, that includes protesters and presidents, rioters and business owners, blacks and whites, Muslims and atheists, those that abort babies, and those who mistreat the children they have. If you, think, if you think that loving those people and pouring out grace towards them is impossible, you are correct. It's not possible for human beings to do any of those things by, the strength, of, by strength of will, theirs or somebody else's. In other words, I can't do it, but also nobody can force me to do it either. It has to come from God. The grace of God is our only hope. And without it, there will be no more United States of America because we are coming apart at the seams, if you haven't noticed. And if you haven't noticed, you've been blind for 100 years, just so you know, because it's been coming apart that long. It goes to the very core of our country because it's the core of every citizen in our country and in the world. I don't know what kind of country my grandchildren will be living in when they turn 60. And they think that's a long time away. And I just smile because it'll be here in the blink of an eye. I don't mean like I'll be like 140 or something, but you know, other than that. Uh, but this place will be nothing like it is now. It, the United States might not even exist by the time they're 60. It could be different countries all over. The great divide is going to continue to grow until either the grace of God intercedes or it blows us apart into a gazillion pieces, each one doing what's right in their own eyes. In the midst of this mess, we find ourselves reminded in verse 1 of chapter 5 that we are called to be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The church is called to give up her wills. I use the plural there because the church today is anything but one. We are a multitude of wills. And give itself up as a sacrifice to save those who want to be saved. The church is called to lay down what it wants by loving those who hate her, which is pretty much everyone, uh, but especially our own children who are leaving the church in droves. What follows is what the people of God should not embrace in the, in the passage. Sexual immorality, all impurity or covetousness, Wanting what you want over what God wants. That's what covetousness is. Those things must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. See, the absence of those things is what the body of Christ is supposed to look like. 
supposed to not just look like, it's supposed to be that way. The absence of all of those things. This is not some standard that we try to force on the world. There is no reason non-believers should stop doing any of these things. These things apply only to believers because these things can only be produced through the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I'm afraid the notion of the goodness of all humanity is still held to be true by both believers and unbelievers, or at least the notion that we can be good if we're taught the right things. But teaching the commandments doesn't equal doing the commandments. Doing the commandments is a fruit of the Spirit. It's called self-control. If and when any goodness is birthed in the church as the fruit of the Spirit and not of our own strength, there may be hope for the lost. But until the church really understands that these things cannot be done by sheer force of will or by education, she will not be of any import to the world and how it turns. None whatsoever. She will not be the leaven that's supposed to leaven the whole earth. Paul continues on. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Expose racism for what it is. Expose hatred for what it is. Expose theft for what it is. Expose slavery for what it is. Expose the, de uh, ex expose the devaluation of the dollar for what it is. Expose the dehumanization dehumanization of people for what it is. Expose segregation for what it is. Expose murder for what it is. You see, we are here to expose the darkness, not cover it up and hope it goes away. Why? It's, it's shameful to even the fact that I had to speak all of those things which are 100% true in the world that we live in. We don't even do it in secret anymore like Paul says. We do it out in the open. The sins of the Roman Empire are a cakewalk compared to what goes on in the name of righteousness in our day and age. I wonder just how dim the light of the church is these days because Paul in verse 13 says, when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. I'm pretty sure that the church would be shocked if the light of Christ were shown on us here today in any church that's meeting anywhere. I know that our cities, states, and countries would be devastated if and when that actually happened. Why? Because we make our living off of corruption. There's no doubt that the church doesn't expect that to happen. Nor does it want it to happen because we love the darkness more than we love the light. We like the way things are here. And if we could just tweak it just a little bit, everything would be wonderful. If the radicals would just stop rocking the boat, we'd be the greatest nation on earth once again. We might be, but we would not be the greatest nation in God's eyes. We would not be it because we're not built on the foundation of the scriptures. We're built on the foundation of enlightenment philosophy. They are not the same thing. By the way, the, 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 the way things are do not reflect the light of the love of God or we wouldn't be in the mess we're in now. Verse 15 continues on, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What is the will of the Lord? It's pretty clear. The will of the Lord is that you and I love our enemies. That's the will of the Lord. That we weep with the brokenhearted that we comfort the disenfranchised. I beg you to ask, God, what 
his will for you is in your everyday life. And then be willing to actually do it. For sure, it includes what's coming up in the next verses, not getting drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. Now, we oftentimes stop there and say stuff like, well, you really shouldn't drink at all. Not true, not true at all, not true anywhere in Scripture. Drunkenness is something that delivers you temporarily from the pain of life. It numbs you. But you can be drunk on anything. You need to understand that. You can be drunk on wine. You can be drunk on food. You can be drunk on anger or bitterness, sex with yourself or sex with others, or even pictures of sex. You can be numb on all of those things. You can be drunk on all of those things. Drunkenness is whatever you rely on to help you make it through the day apart from the living God. Paul's clear, don't be drunk. And then he offers the alternative, be filled with the Spirit. What an appropriate comparison because when the disciples and the 3,000 were filled with the Spirit, they acted so differently from normal people that the normal people said they were drunk. That's how evident it should be that we are in Christ and filled with the Spirit. Paul is not talking uh, about a church service when he says that we should be addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. On the contrary, that is the life that sets believers apart from unbelievers. Now notice he, he doesn't say that you should be doing these things out loud. He's not talking about a church service here. We always think that this is about a church service. This is just about your everyday normal life. He's saying this is the stuff that should be going on in your heart all the time. What a huge difference than the earlier part of the week that I talked about, the beginning of the sermon. I wasn't filled with any of that stuff. I didn't have the joy of the Lord. I still have a long, long way to go. There's a lot of work for the Spirit to do in me, most of which my old man dreads. He doesn't want to die. But if Christ is to truly live in me, he has to die. My will must be done away with so that the will of Christ may be manifested through the Holy Spirit who abides in me. Unless he dies... Christ will not and cannot abide in me. There's only room for one living being in here, and it's either me or Christ. That's it. There's no other alternatives. You know, we can't sublet my heart and say, oh, Jesus, you can have that back room over there. I get the rest. You know, no, no. Either Jesus comes and kicks you out, or you don't let him in. Those are the only two options. The call here is to seek first who you will serve. It is a call to wake up to the darkness that is all around us, inside and outside. It is a call to humble ourselves that God might be merciful. For there's no hope for any nation. They will all be conquered by Christ. And if you, if you need proof of that, read the book of Revelation. He's going to conquer every nation because he is Lord already over all of them and none of them will be, be able to rise up and say, look how great we are or we were. Look what we did for God. It's not going to happen. He's going to put his thumb on every single nation and say, submit to me or die. And look at the past history of the nations. How many nations have died? Lots and lots and lots of them are just remnants, you know? Uh, we will be a remnant just like they are. Maybe not in our lifetime, maybe not in our children's lifetime. But you know what? A little over 200 years is a, is a drop in the bucket for a lot of nations, uh, you know? I don't know what God's doing, but I know that he's not going to let arrogance towards him 
and lack of humbleness towards him stand uh, in individuals or in nations. Um, everyone and every nation will be conquered by Christ. The nation's will and your will will not be done in the long run. Let's close with prayer. Oh, Father, pour out your spirit upon us so that we may be filled with the spirit and die to ourselves. Please make it so. Amen.